Hey everyone, welcome back to Better Biomed. Today we are going to go ahead and we're going to take a look at a hand control for a surgical table, but it's a different type of surgical table. This one is going to be a radiological table, which means that the deck is going to be radiolucent. It's, it's a very special like C-arm table. But anyway, it also has a very special control. Now this control, uh, apparently, from what I've heard, the doctor himself took it apart and wanted to know what was going on with it. Uh, they get some symptoms with some of these units that the controls are being reversed, which is weird, because usually you lose one direction or the other, and that has to do with the micro switches or with the Hall effect sensors. But um, they said that they were reversed. Curious. Never opened one of these up. We're going to go ahead and take a look. Coming up next, right here on Better Biomed. Okay, guys, here we have our hand control for our C-arm table. And uh, let me tell you, this is for a DRE C-arm table. It's, uh, it's one very similar to the table I just did a video on a few days ago where I actually did a repair. But uh, one of the things I got to tell you guys is that this is a beefy hand control. Now, it does have a couple weak links. Don't get me wrong. But when it comes to overall quality, it appears like they spared no expense when it comes to overall quality. So this guy is an absolute beast, would make a killer video game system, you know. But um, anyway, this guy here, it feels very heavy, okay? So first off, we have the joystick, which has the activation control. Boop, boop, boop. We have uh, running, reset, and lock, unlock, plus uh, table rotate buttons. I don't know. I uh, haven't quite figured it out. We've got table tilt, up and down, our left and right. We've got Trendelenburg, reverse Trendelenburg, and we have table up and table down. That's the core features of this guy right here. Everything, like, look how this joystick locks up. It feels incredibly sturdy. So that's why I'm a little bit confused on some of the design choices they chose for the cable. Now, if there's one thing that you guys should learn about all my videos, is that I say that equipment breaks where the user interfaces with the equipment, right? That would be all this, which these feel like they're built incredibly well. So they did right there. But also things fail where the soft components meet the rigid components. That is this guy, all right? So the cable itself has got a really nice durometer that is the hardness of the rubber. And uh, it's got, what, a, a 12 pin, something like that. It's, it's incredibly <laughs> crazy. But there, there's just a couple features on this guy that kind of drive me crazy. So I have not opened this up yet. I don't know the symptom. But one of the things I want you guys to take a look at, the connector is already unscrewing. See that? That's not good because that's when you have all these conductors on the inside and they'll twist. And when they twist, they want to stretch, they want to break, the conductor, the insulators will start pulling back from yankage and stuff, and then uh, you'll have exposed conductor, and when you twist it, they'll want to touch each other. That's not a good thing. I mean, it's, it's, it seems like it's a, a durable built connector, but you can see the whole entire thing is held together by a little tiny screw, which is not there. That screw's missing. Now, again, I was told that a doctor was interested in how this thing works. I would naturally assume that the doctor didn't take this guy apart though. He probably took the base unit apart. So with that being said, we know we have one issue, this guy right here. I might be able to fix that. We have to take that apart no matter what, because whenever you have a connector that's moving, you have to disassemble it and you have to see if any of those conductors are broke. We might even have to ohm them out. So let's go ahead and flip this guy over. And we have perimeter screws. And then I have three screws down here in the corner. You see that? So the perimeter screws are definitely what's holding this thing together. These guys down here in the corner, I don't know their job. We're gonna figure that out. So first step, we're gonna take out all these guys. They are Phillips number two. I 
tell you, this guy is incredibly heavy. All right, there we go. What? Okay. I'm perhaps a little more confused. I'm going to go ahead and dis uh, disassemble these two inner cables. Boop. These guys right here. Come on. Come on. There we go. And I got one cable down here on the board. Come on. There we go. So that separates our back panel from the main controller. Here we go. So the reason that I was confused and quiet is because we have three screws right here. This appears so German built, it's not even funny. So this little cover right here, this little guy right here, is how they do the through panel right there for this cable. See that? You loosen those three up. Now we can uh, do something with this cable to secure it, which is mainly one of the repairs that we have to do today. Because this guy right here, you can see that it's just sloppily sliding up and down. It's got a stopper right here. And uh, you can see it's just floating in the breeze. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to shrink tube it, especially since I've got plenty of real estate inside this device. We're going to secure it. We're going to shrink tube it properly with that stopper down at the base plate like it should be. And I might actually take it a step further and I might hot glue it or something to keep it from spinning because spinning is how a lot of cables break. Now there is nothing really here to stop it from spinning. It's just a through hole and that cable can rotate at its wildest leisure. That is not good for the longevity of the device. All right, so there's the cables. This guy is our prime suspect. Definitely, anytime a cable moves around a controller, it's, it's gonna be suspect. Uh, wow, holy cow, yes! This controller is an absolute beast. They used all commercial grade uh, components inside it from what I can see. Um, this right here, this massive guy, this is your joystick. And it's got gain uh, potentiometers right here for each of the axes. So I bet you, I bet you it's Hall effect sensors. And it's Hall effect sensors because what you're doing is you're adjusting the gain or the sensitivity of the Hall effect sensor through these guys right here. How cool is that? And uh, this guy here would probably be a voltage regulator because. Um, that's definitely what you're going to have to have for this guy is a, a stable, stable voltage source. There is something uh, that I noticed right up here on the Joy. See this little IC and this little IC over here. It appears to have some sort of corrosion. Now that could be just from whatever choices uh, they made for um, flux, but I don't like trusting stuff like that. So I think I'm going to go ahead and clean that board with some alcohol. There we go. Let's go ahead and take this. Let's take it apart. You know, why not? You guys are here to see me take some stuff apart. I'm going to pop this board off the bottom of this uh, joystick. And we are going to find out if it's Hall Effects sensors. The, the very best joysticks that you can buy are Hall Effects that uses magnetic fields to determine the, the direction and uh, to also determine the extent, like how far over the joystick is being applied. So if you move it just a little bit, it'll move slowly, but if you move it over really fast, it goes faster and faster and faster. So it's an analog joystick. When you're talking digital joysticks, with digital, it's all on or all off. That's what you got. And you probably don't want that for a positioning system for a C-arm. A positioning system for a C-arm, you want to slowly move the patient. Or if the patient just gets on the table, you want to probably do something called a rapid movement, which is when you move it faster into a near position and then for fine detail so that you get the patient in the field, you're going to use, you know, fine motor movement. So that's why I believe it's using Hall Effect Sensors. And that's also why I believe it's going to be all analog. Oh man, I'm just making a mess of this. So I've got uh, washers, we got lock washers, 
like I said, these guys, it appeared like they have spared no expense on building this guy. And as far as I can tell, it really looks like this guy is all analog. And these current, these current pots, they're also a clear indicator that it's analog. Clear indicator. Okay. Well, it's not the easiest thing in the world to get all these components out. Here, hold on. Let me select from a different screwdriver. There we go. And they do appear to be magnetic, so they're stainless steel, but they're also the, the variant that's magnetic. Cool. Oh, okay, okay. Well, it's not coming out too easily, so that means that the lead cable is really short. Oh, no. Okay. Well, can I show these guys? All right. So you can see the gimbals inside there. See that? There's two traces, and those gimbals are attached at the sides right there with, I would assume that those are Hall effect sensors, but I just can't see. They could be potentiometers. Um, I mean, it's not like a heavy, heavy use item. So you have, you have your axes, and it can move linear one direction or the other. And at the end of those axes, so if this axis rotates like this, you have at the end of that axis either a Hall effect sensor or a potentiometer that's recording the, the degree or the amount of movement. And there's going to be some pretty high resolution there, I, I bet. So that means it's going to be pretty sensitive. But uh, yeah, those wires, you see, those wires are soldered to that board, and that is not going to be easy to get out. So I'm going to carefully put this guy back together. Now it looks safe. It looks like there is no broken wires and it looks like it's good to go. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a couple of these screws back in. I'm not going to put them all back in, but I'm going to put a couple of them in because those wires are soldered to the board, which kind of sucks because that means that I can't pull it out and show you guys. I was hoping it was going to be like a ribbon cable or something. Nope. Soldered to the board. Let's just put a couple fasteners in to hold this guy down so that I can proceed to check the other switches. Okay. All right, so let's see, what do we got? Um, this right here is the main control board and it has a whole series of, what are those, op amps? Yeah, and and, they're all attached to each one of these controls. And remember, the controls, these guys here are double throw switches, all right? They're momentary, which means they're on and off. Like as soon as you release, they're, they're off. See that? They're all momentary, they don't latch on. But um, these guys over here are double pull. Are they double pull, double throw? Yeah. Double pull, double throw switches. And these guys here are momentary buttons. And the wiring looks fantastic. Looks pretty good. So I'm automatically going to assume that the problems are in the cable because like I said, most all problems are gonna occur where the user interfaces with the device or where the, the soft part meets the rigid part. And that is the cable, essentially. Um, so the ports on these boards, another spot that could be damaged because of yanking, um, they look solid. In fact, this board is semi-floating. You see that? That's okay because with semi-floating, that means that there's less stuff that's going to be uh, affected by a yank. Everything looks solid, really solid. Okay. Uh, let's see. I'm just checking out the rest of these cables, making sure that None of them have been pinched from a previous repair. Looks good. Okay. So the cable itself, let's go and bring it down. It does have a little strain relief right here. 
And that strain relief is not molded, is it? I don't believe it's molded. So a strain relief like that, we can usually move it just a little bit using alcohol. All right. So what I'm doing is I'm putting a little bit of alcohol in there. I'm going to move it around a little bit and see if it breaks it loose. Now, a lot of cables, it's molded in and you can't, you can't move the strain relief. This guy here, I, I don't really think it's molded. If it is, it is. Oh, nope, it's not molded. All right, it was glued. That's good for us. That's really good for us. Because if I can move the strain relief right here, then I can give myself a little bit more material for the backside for inside when I secure it. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to secure it with shrink tube and the shrink tube has to have, you know, some of the outer insulation to grab onto. So there we go. Uh, it's just glued, which reminds me that when I put it back together, I can put a, just a drop of super glue on the strain relief. We'll be good. Okay, so there we are. I moved it up just a little bit. Now you can see the through panel. There, there you can see it. Now it's got more material to sit on. So I can move up this little collar right here. There we go. Yes, yes, yes. All right, so now that the collar's moved up, just like that. Now I need my shrink tube. So let's go get some, I'll be right back. All right guys, I've got my shrink tube ready. We're good to go. So one of the, the key details for shrink tube is you want to make sure that your shrink tube is going to fit over your connectors. And uh, luckily, I came back and took a second measurement because I was going to try this 3 8 But uh, while it will fit over one connector, the other one is much larger. Okay. So uh, here's what we're going to do. You're going to turn the connector a little bit sideways like so. And then just fit it through, all right? And then I have little tools to chase it and to push it all the way through the shrink tube. Just like so. There it is. All right, so there's one. Here is the skinnier one. Always start with the thicker one because after you get a cable through the connector, now you got less real estate inside the connector to push your second one through. So that's why I started with the fat one. Now I'm going to do the skinnier one. Again, turn it sideways and feed it through. There we are. Excellent. Okay, both my connectors are through. Now I'm going to go ahead and feed them all the way down to the base. Right here. And my stopper, I'm going to make sure it's all the way tight against the wall. Make sure that my cable on the back side is all the way tight, flush to the back side. It's, it's got to be tight, guys, because in other words, you're doing all this for nothing. Here we go. All the way down. Next, while the heat shrink tube is as close to the panel, the through panel as possible, that's when I'm going to heat it up and shrink it down. So we want to make sure that there's as little uh, movement as possible when we go to start shrinking. Okay, so I can see right now when my heat shrink started to move. That's not good for me. So here, let's go ahead and dangle this guy off the side. I need to reseat it because again, as things heat up, they tend to move. We want that to be as tight as possible when that heat shrink starts curing because it's got a glue on the inside, all right? Here we go. So you can see I'm using my hand to kind of force it down as far as it and tight as it'll go. And I want to get it really, really hot down there near the base. Because that, I want it to melt that glue and adhere so that that stopper will not go all the way back up the cable again. Which is what created a lot of these problems in the first place. So the cool thing about heat shrink 
is that they come in two different varieties. One of them is just regular single layer, and there's dual layer, which is the only type that I use on medical equipment. It's got an inner glue that when you heat it up, it'll melt to everything on the inside of it, and it acts like a strain relief, which is exactly what I want. Plus, it makes things watertight because that glue adheres to everything on the inside. That's starting to look real good. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and bend that over because while it's hot, it's pliable, which is really important. So what I'm gonna do next, so I'm gonna take my hot glue because again, like I said, it's rotating and I don't want it to rotate ever. If it was keyed or something, it'd be different. You can see right there, see how it's rotating around just for me moving the cable around? You don't want things to rotate. That's really, really bad. So what I'm gonna do, it's got this neat little port right here. Now it's like a dog bone. See that? So that dog bone is essentially useless on this device. Yeah, it's got no real function, but it does for me because if I put a little bit of glue down there, what it's going to do is it's gonna adhere around the cable and it's gonna go in that dog bone and it's gonna prevent it from rotating, sorry. So I'm not gonna just shoot a whole huge amount of glue in there, but just enough to get it really sloppy messy and then uh, keep it from rotating. Very important. All right, my, one of the things I love about these DeWalt guns is that they get really hot really quickly. It's got a ceramic heater. And compared to some of the other guns, I can be up and running probably a minute faster, maybe two minutes faster. So I love the DeWalt hot glue guns. There we go. So I'm just filling some in the pocket around the connector. And then make sure that the glue comes up the cable because you want it to adhere to the cable and make sure that the cable doesn't spin. There we are. All right. So if you get a lot of strings in your hot glue like that, that's why you can take your hot air gun. Heat them up and they disappear like magic. Pretty cool, huh? Oh, okay. All right. I'm going to put this guy back together and uh, we'll finish this guy up. Should be good to go. Okay, guys. It's looking good. I got my two cables connected back up. My glue is now cooled off. You, can, you guys can see what it's doing. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna route these cables carefully down to their original positions. Make sure that no cables are getting trapped on the seams. And then let's go ahead and sink some of these guys in. Now, since these are screws that are going to be in an operating environment, they should be using Loctite. So I will go through and use some Loctite on these in just a few minutes. Uh, the blue Loctite. But for the sake of brevity, <laughs> I'm going to just lightly put them in. There we go. Okay, so the base unit is good to go. And to take some strain off the strain relief right here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna loosen up the hold down screw because that gives it something to sit on. Now, let's take a look at this connector because this guy is moving around and it is very suspicious. Anything that moves that shouldn't be moving is going to be an, a point of failure, so. Well, I guess the good thing is, is I already have this guy loosened up down here, so that's not an issue. And let's see, I have the same. No, this this end right here, it looks like it's molded. The uh, strain relief is molded in. Okay. Well, let's see. On this type of connector. really don't have very much space. So what I'm doing is I'm shoving the cord up into the yank guard or the strain relief so that 
I can examine all the pins on the inside and make sure that they're okay. I see shrink tube on all of them. And they look like they're good. So what I'm going to do is sink that guy back down and I'm going to get a fastener for it. And I'm going to re-secure the cable here at the strain guard, the yank guard. Because there is zero tolerance whatsoever. I mean, it is so tight, just like the joystick. I had almost no room to look in there. It's extremely tight. So let's go ahead and tighten down this guard. There we go. And I'll get this uh, fastener for right here. It's holding the inner piece in. <laughs> and it will also get some Loctite. And then this cable is going to be good to go. Yep, right there. So, guys, there we go. That is a uh, correct inspection and, and hopefully a repair of a common failure on these guys. And that is the cord itself and its through panel opening. Now, I'm, I'm pretty sure that you could probably buy a replacement cable from DRE. Uh, that would be through Avante now. And I'm pretty sure that they sell the cord. But if I was in the field and I need this table to be back up and going, which you almost always do, because they never have spares of these kind of tables. Uh, this is what I would do in the field, get them back up and going, especially if I don't have to rewire any pins. Uh, hopefully not. So I'm going to go and I'm going to take this guy back, put it on the table and we're gonna do an inspection. So guys, um, hope you like that brief little teardown of uh, a hand control. It's a, a special little guy, it's absolutely built like a tank. It is five, six pounds, maybe more. It's extremely heavy. And uh, you know, I wouldn't mind something like this for video games because it, it feels that nice, like as far as controls. And especially if they are Hall Effect. Anyway, there you guys go. Hope you guys like this video. If you do, please give me a thumbs up. It helps me so much with the Google algorithm, which, you know, they own YouTube. And uh, guys, if you have any more suggestions for content, why don't you go ahead and let me know? I'm doing my absolute best to try and make that happen. Thanks for watching, guys.